Okay. As I said before on Monday, when you take your EKG exam, you're going to have a matching section. And the matching section, well, a few matching sections, but one of the matching sections, approximately eight points worth, will be these, this slide and not the next one, but the following two after this one, where it describes that every bullet you see will be an answer choice. So P wave will be an answer choice. QRS complex will be an answer choice. T wave will be an answer choice. QT interval you'll see on another slide will be an answer choice. And you will have to match those answer choices to descriptions. The descriptions will come from this slide. P wave, just to say it again. The P wave re is basically showing you atrial depolarization. When we learned about vector analysis, you learned why the pen went up for the P wave when we used lead two as our recording lead. Clearly, if we used ABR as our recording lead, the P wave would go which way? AVR goes up and to the right, so the P wave would be inverted, wouldn't it? And there was a question I asked you, what would the EKG look like if someone strapped Lee 2 on backwards? And you all said this picture would be flipped, inverted, the mirror image. So that's AVR, basically. So P wave represents atrial depolarization. What mechanical event will occur? Atrial contraction. What would happen as a result of that? The last 20% of the ventricles would fill. And at that time when the atria contract and squeeze that 20% into the ventricles, the blood would be sloshing around in the ventricles and we would hear heart sound four. We would need a special piece of equipment to hear it, but it does occur. Tyler's confused. Heart sound three, thank you. Heart sound three is when the chambers, all of them are at rest. Diastasis, the AV valves are open. The blood is pouring from the atria into the ventricles and sloshing around. Thank you. That was important that you clarify that. QRS complex, complex represents the ventricular depolarization. Ventricular depolarization happens a little bit more slowly and that is the reason why we have three cardiac vectors during this event. We have the Q, which points up and to the right to show that the right side of the IV septum is somewhat delayed behind the left. The right side of the IV septum is delayed behind the left under normal circumstances. Overall, the R represents that both bundle branches are trying to carry current to the apex. And then we see the S because we know the current is moving around the right ventricular wall and left ventricular wall but we know that vectors point to what surface charge? And which side of the ventricular walls has the thicker mass? Left, so which side is going to have cells that are waiting the longest? The left, and so we point up to the left, and that's how we get our S. Up and to the left is anti-parallel to down and to the left, right? It's going in opposite directions. Then we see the T wave. This represents ventricular repolarization. This happens very quickly, which is why we only have one cardiac vector. The top of the IV septum still has a negative charge. When the apex gets its positive charge back, remember rest and repol. Repolarization is when we get positive charges back. So if the apex repolarizes before the top of the IV septum, that vector would point down and to the left. And that means the pen would go up. And that's why we see the T wave. Okay. 
many, many students do not learn vector analysis when they learn about EKGs. I have been challenged on this by many professors when I've taught at different schools. They say, why do they need it? To what end? And I think if you fundamentally know why the pen goes up or down, that makes you stronger as a healthcare person, healthcare provider. Not only that, when you take your EKG classes, many of you will, it means you won't have to memorize as much. And I hate just cold memorization, rote memorization. I would rather know why. So on the screen up here, you see an EKG tracing. Which lead is probably used for the comparison, for the recording lead? Two. If it were AVR, what would that picture look like? Inverted. Now, in the Tuesday, Thursday class, and there are three of you in here, poor Rachel, when we were doing our analyses of the EKG, when, remember on Monday, I taught you how to draw your baseline, your best fit line, and you had to measure the upward deflection and subtract away from it the downward deflection and take the algebraic sum. Well, she started analyzing leads one, two, and three to get her algebraic sum. And lead two was where we started. I said, now find your R. It should be an upward deflection. You remember what she said? She went, it is not. And I said, it should be. She said, it's not. So everything was flip-flopped for her EKG. And she was the one that said, I think my lab partners put on the leads backwards. So she came to lab last night. Her partners hooked her up. They actually paid attention to her right arm versus left arm. And wouldn't you know, she got a normal EKG because of that. Perfect example of how easy it is to forget its anatomical position. It's your patient's right and your patient's left. So she finally got her R wave to go up for lead two. Super good. Down here, this is showing you in orange the action potential of a contractile cell. Contractile cells, remember, are the majority of your heart tissue. They are the reason why you see this EKG pattern, but that is not, that is not an action potential. And a lot of students that don't learn vector analysis, if you ask them what an EKG is, many times they say it's a picture of an action potential. No, it's not. I understand why they make that mistake because we say, we say words like depolarization, repolarization, and those were words that we used in lecture unit two to describe an action potential. But this is not a picture of an action potential. This is a comparison of two vectors and the machine with a pen obeying simple rules. Pen goes up when the cardiac vector and the recording lead are parallel. Pen goes down when those two vectors are anti-parallel. Pen will go to flat line when there is no current or perpendicular. Now, never, never will I ask you about perpendicular vectors. Never, never. But I beg my students to remember that the pen will flat line if there's no current. I also beg you to remember that it could also go back to baseline if it is perpendicular. But please, don't be that nurse when you see on the EKG screen, beep. Please don't be that nurse going, it's just perpendicular vectors. Just give it a moment. It'll be fine. Probably not fine. <laughs> Do something, please. 
Down here, we see the five <coughs> phases of a contractile cell. Phase zero, the upward stroke. Phase zero, the opening of sodium voltage-gated channels. Phase one, the closing of those sodium voltage-gated channels and the cell starting to repolarize. But then, calcium voltage-gated channels open and we get the plateau phase, also known as phase two. This is when we have calcium activated calcium release. Calcium is part of the action potential. That was not the case in unit two when we learned about action potentials of neurons and skeletal muscle. Calcium was never part of the literal picture. Phase three, repolarization, our good old friend, the potassium voltage gated channels opening. Then phase four, a stable resting membrane potential. I am trying to superimpose this action potential to the events of the EKG. So when you see the R, that is roughly when you would see phase zero of the action potential of a contractile cell. When you see the T wave, the peak of the T wave, that is when the contractile cells are actively repolarizing. And notice phase two, the plateau phase. Where is that on your EKG? Phase two is happening during the ST segment, a flat line. When we look at this flat line on the EKG, it's all too easy to say nothing's happening. Nothing's happening electrically because everything is happening mechanically now. Electrical events precede mechanical. The EKG is monitoring electrical events. Those are over with during the ST segment. But contraction is happening now. That's a mechanical event. And in fact, if you actually monitored how much tension was being created, the contractile force would be peaked during the ST segment. So please, from now on, when you look at an EKG and you're looking at this patient, when you see the ST segment, even though electrically it looks like nothing is happening, I want you to think inside, if you could cut open that patient's chest, you would see the ventricles doing this. And you would be getting that stroke volume ejected from the ventricles. The mechanical event is occurring at that time. <clears throat> Continuing on with your matching segment, segments are flat lines. Here are the segments you are responsible for. You are responsible for the PR segment, the ST segment, and the TP segment, three of them. Your responsibility is to show me where they begin and where they end, how to measure them in distance. We're gonna work on that in just a moment when I'm done talking to you. Your responsibility is also to know the importance of them. For example, the PR segment represents one of the two delays I told you about before spring break. There are two delays in the heart to allow the atria to have their electrical and mechanical events before the ventricles. The two delays are at the AV node, because those cells are small and they have few intercalated discs. We also have a delay in the bundle of Hiss. The PR segment represents the delay at the AV node only. The ST segment I already told you about just in the previous slide. The ST segment represents your contractile force 
being optimal. It's the time after the electrical event of the ventricles depolarizing before they repolarize. What mechanical is, event is happening at this time? Peak tension, bless you. Peak maximal force. This is when we're getting our stroke volume, ejection of blood. The TP segment represents the amount of time in between the T wave to the beginning of the next P wave. It represents the amount of time for the heart to rest. When you start calculating your segments and intervals in about 15 minutes, I want you to calculate a TP segment of the person in your group that had to have a resting EKG and also exercised. I want you to calculate their TP segment at rest and after they exercised. And what you should see is that the TP segment is shortened after exercise. And I really want you to think critically about that. If you have a faster heart rate, that means your heart is working harder. Agreed? Tissues that are working harder should have more blood flow to them. More blood delivering oxygen and nutrition like glucose. The irony should not be lost on you. When the heart is working harder and your heart rate is elevated, that TP segment is shortened. It means less time for the heart to rest. It's working harder. Less time for the ventricles to fill. And even more scary, less time for the tissue to actually be perfused. Remember, blood can only flow through the coronary arteries when the ventricles are relaxed. So if they're contracting more frequently, the very heart tissue that needs more blood flow actually is getting less. When your heart rate goes up, all, all of these segments and intervals shorten up. They all do. But the one that shortens up disproportionately more than the others is the TP segment. Arguably, you heard me say, arguably a reason why not to exercise, right? Arguably. But the health, the cardiovascular health we get when we do cardiovascular exercise, the benefits come when we're done exercising and when we are at rest. When we work out and we're doing cardiovascular exercises, our heart gets bigger. There's more myocardial mass. It remodels appropriately, equally wide as in in height. Remember that from Monday? And when you are at rest after exercising, your heart is so amazing as a pump. It gets a really rigor, very vigorous, I should say not rigorous, vigorous stroke volume. Remember I went to Elizabeth on Monday and the brain says, you're so good at this. And the heart's like, I'm good at this? And the brain says, you're amazing. You can have a break. And for my Tuesday, Thursday class, specifically the Tuesday class, I gave this example that I'm going to put on the board. You need to make a dollar. You have quarters. How many of them do you need to make a dollar? Good. Matt's like, eh, four. Good. Okay. If I have a smaller denomination, if I have dimes and I want to make a dollar, what will I have to do? How many of them will I need? Ten. I'll need more, won't I? The denomination went down, so I'm going to need more of them to make up the difference. Are you following? 
If I have five cents, the de denomination went down even more, what will I have to do to compensate to get a dollar? 20, I'm gonna have to have a higher quantity. Agreed? Okay, so let's take that and put it into perspective of tonight's lecture on the cardiac cycle. Your body needs five liters of blood delivered every minute. Think of that as your one dollar. I need a dollar. My body needs five liters. How do I get that? Over here, I multiplied a denomination by a quantity, didn't I? This is called cardiac output. It's the amount of blood traveling to, through, and out of the heart per minute, and similarly through your body. How do I calculate that? I multiply stroke volume, which is the amount of blood ejected per beat, times heart rate, which is beats per minute. The beats cancel out, and I'm left with milliliters per minute, cardiac output. A traditional stroke volume is 70. A heart rate traditionally is 70 beats per minute. And you can see we would get dangerously close to our five liters, 4,900 milliliters per minute. Dangerously close to five liters. Okay. If the heart gets better as a pump, if stroke volume goes to 90, what can the heart rate do? Okay. We still have five liters. It can go down, can't it? That's your brain saying to the heart, you're so good at this. You got such a good stroke volume, you can deserve to take a break a longer break. And it's a win-win because when the heart rests, more blood is allowed to fill the ventricles. I remember on Monday I said, think of the ventricles feeling like a water balloon. Do you remember that? They're sagging grandma's boobs. And as more ventricles, as the ventricles fill with more blood, think of that as a slingshot being pulled. The more you pull that slingshot pouch, the greater the rock is launched with force. So more filling, stroke volume goes up. It's a win-win. So that is the reason why you want to exercise. Your heart gets better as a pump, and then the brain says, you're awesome. Take a longer break. And then the heart gets more oxygen delivered and nutrition. It's a win-win. Does that make sense? Okay, so what else are you going to be responsible for knowing with these segments? Where they begin and where they end. By that I mean, you are going to know on your EKG, let's do the ST segment. You, segments are flat lines. So here's the beginning of the ST segment when I return to baseline after the S to the beginning of the T. Tonight, when I'm done talking to you for a moment, you're going to measure the distance between those lines. Juliana, you might get the test version for two points I ask you to calculate the time of the ST segment. Tyler, you might be given the test version where you have to calculate the time of the PR segment. Elizabeth, you might have the test version where I ask you to calculate the TP segment. Here's what you need to do to get your full two points. Juliana, you have the ST. Juliana reads her instructions and it clearly states, please use the bottom tracing. Remember the bottom tracing at the, at the bottom was all from lead two. Juliana goes and she finds her lead two tracing and she says, right then, I need to show my work. 
For a point and a half out of two points, I have to show my work. Kara needs to know where I took my measurements. So she makes a mark here at the beginning and a mark here at the end. She then tells me if she used a ruler or she counted. Remember I warned you I'm gonna have to shrink to fit and so the dimensions are not going to be true but you assume if you're counting those dots and those boxes that the dimensions are still okay. Do you remember that? Juliana then uses the following equation. V equals change in D over time. Where did you <coughs> see this before? Lab unit one, the first 20 pages, when if you knew two of the three variables, you could rearrange to solve for the third. Do you remember that? Here's the equation again. Velocity is your paper speed. In your lab, that was 25 millimeters per second. Do not assume paper speed. I have to give it to you. It will be given to you in your directions. I might just make up a paper speed. This discourages cheating. So you might be sitting next to someone who has to calculate the same segment as you, but they have different paper speeds. Not in your best interest to copy them then. Distance. That's what you measured with your ruler or counted the dots. It's in millimeters. Do you remember what millimeters are using those rulers? Make sure you review what a millimeter is. Because this is the point in the semester where I go home and I beat Mac. No, I do. When he comes in here, ask him. This is the time where I say, because you all forget, even though you had a test on the metric system. The Tuesday, Thursday class already heard this. Hayden is actually the one that probably remembers me screaming the most. Mac was still too little. I go home, two points, two easy points, and students give me measurements in inches, not the metric, and I go home and I go, Somebody! Which side is the metric system? And then Hayden, especially, Mom, why are you yelling at us when your students are bad? Show me which side is the metric system. And Hayden, they're like, it's the side that says metric. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'll give him a pencil or a pen. I'll say, measure this in millimeters. It's <laughs> 120 millimeters. How did you know that? emotionally scarred. <laughs> oh, I lose my mind. And I about lost my shit two summers ago when I had the equivalent of Mac as a student. <laughs> His name was Jason. He still drunk texts me. <laughs> he still He's still, every semester, is it the EKG test? Make sure you have them review the units on that ruler. It was very misleading, Kara. I didn't know that that was in centimeters, not mil. I'm like, you, you had a test on that. You should have reviewed it. No! You had the test on it already! He still texts me. Next time he drunk, texts me. I'll save it and I'll show it to you all. The other day, when he, before spring break, he was at a party out of his mind drunk. And he had another student of mine with him at this party. And they're at the party. He's like, 
Okay, let's go through the drugs of lecture unit two. Tell me the drugs that are antagonistic to the parasympathetic nervous system. And, and poor Mackenzie, she's like, ah. um, antagonist. Does that mean they we were helping? I mean, they were out of their mind and at a party doing this. I'm like, don't, you're never going to be invited back. <laughs> don't do that. It's horrible. Where do you begin your, your PR segment? At the end of the P to the beginning of the Q. Well, then why the hell care do they call it a PR segment? Well, because some people don't have a Q. And if they don't have a Q, then it would go straight to the R. Remember, a segment is a flat line. So for the PR segment, you go from the end of the P to the beginning of the Q or the beginning of the R. So it's the flat line is what I'm trying to say. It represents the delay at the AV node. The TP segment, it's from the end of the T to the beginning of the next P. Again, segments are flat lines. And the TP segment represents the amount of time for the heart to rest, fill, and be perfused. <coughs> it is the one that will be shortened up the most. I ask a multiple test question on these segments. Not just matching, but what is their importance? What about intervals? Intervals include one or more waves. So what are the intervals you will be responsible for? A P to P, an R to R, a T to T, a Q to Q. What's the importance of those intervals, R to R? One B. It is one B. Why do we usually use R to R to calculate one beat? It is easy, it's very prominent. But could I use P to P, like the beginning of a P to the beginning of the next P? I could, but R to R is just very easy to see. But all of those types of intervals represent one cardiac cycle, one beat. QT interval, you start your measurement right before the Q, right before the dip. And again, if it's not there, then that means you start the measurement right before you see the upstroke for the R. So you begin here, and you end for the QT interval at the end of the T. That represents the time for the ventricles to depolarize and repolarize. That's the importance of the QT interval. Another interval that you need to be aware of <clears throat> is the PR interval. It goes from the beginning of the P to the beginning of the Q if it's there. The PR interval represents two things. It represents the time for the atria to depolarize and it also represents the AV nodal delay. In your lab manual, in your charts tonight, you're going to calculate your segments and your intervals. You're going to tell me how long they last in time. If you know the paper speed and you measure the distance, can't you rearrange this equation to solve for time? So time would equal distance divided by paper speed. In your lab manual, we give you all of the normal values for all the segments and intervals. Do not memorize them. Do not memorize them. The only one I want you to know is the PR interval. If it is more than 0.2 seconds, this is suggestive of a first degree AV nodal block. First degree block. AV nodal block. It simply means that the delay at the AV node is taking too long now. A delay is good, but
but too long is disastrous potentially because cells come out of absolute refractory period and go into relative and you learned in your physio x that now you can get an extra systole and we can get an extra atrial systole when the ventricles should be getting their turn and now we're not having we're not having we're not having a coordination between the two ventricles, sorry, the two chambers, two sets of chambers. We're not having syncytion. And blood can only flow effectively from high pressure to low. We can't have two sets of chambers contracting at the same time. It's not good. Are you okay with that? So what are the units for intervals and segments? Seconds, you solve for time. So when you get your last half point and you box your answer, I need the correct units. Just to review, two points for calculating heart rate. A point and a half for showing me your work, which R to R you used, the equation. A half point for boxing your answer with the correct units for heart rate, which is beats over minute. Next two points, you will calculate an interval or a segment. Which one? Depends on which test version you get. A point and a half for correctly, correctly marking on your EKG lead to where you began your measurement and where you finished. Showing me that equation. A half point for boxing your answer with the correct units, which is seconds. Then, another two points for calculating mean electrical axis using the compass that you used on Monday, where you use lead one and lead three, the algebraic sum, you plotted it, box your answer. What are the correct units for MEA? Good. That's six points. Five more points for telling me if the pen would go up or down using vector analysis. To remind you, you will have five, the five cardiac vectors in light gray. You will have whatever lead I choose for you right next to each of those five cardiac vectors. And you tell me if the pen goes up. If it goes up, you mark A on your form. If it goes down, you mark B. There is no option for flat line. Pen is either going up or down. <clears throat> that is now 11 points, roughly out of 30, that you are aware of. Straightforward. There will be another eight or so questions matching your, your segments, your intervals, your P wave, your QRS, with their descriptions. It doesn't get any easier than that. There will be a couple of questions on the multiple choice that asks you about the trick for determining MEA. Forwards, and remember backwards. I pick which two leads you are to play with. Do you remember on Monday I said that there were only three combinations that I would use? AVF plus lead one, lead two plus AVL, Lead three plus AVR. Those were the combinations. That means there's a finite set of appropriate responses to learn. Good? And I teased Christine, because she was in the back going, wait a minute. That example you just drew on the board, Kara, I could see two possible answers. Do you remember that? And I said, but what if I only gave you one of those two possible answers? Then we all agreed, okay, that would be a good, that would be a good thing, Kara, because I don't want to have to pick between two. Good? Okay. <clears throat> Another set of matching terms about heart rhythms. Tachycardia. A very fast resting heart rate. What's fast? More than 100 beats per minute at rest. Bradycardia, abnormally slow heart rate. 
What's too slow at rest? Below 60 beats per minute. AV nodal block, first degree. That is when you have a PR interval more than 0.2 seconds. The delay is lasting too long. This is a problem. There are other kinds of nodal blocks. There's first degree, there's second degree, there's third degree. I don't want you to worry about second degree. Second degree is asked in your lab manual, but I don't ask you a question on second degree. Third degree is where you see a disconnect between the atria and the ventricles. You would see a P wave after P wave after P wave after P wave, and then finally a QRST. And the reason why you say that, or say that, see that, I'll remind you, is because all of those specialized cells, remember, can reach threshold on their own. The further away you get from the SA node, remember, the less steep their slope was, and it would take them longer to reach threshold. So those Purkinje fibers can reach threshold on their own. It's just going to take them longer. So if you have a complete third degree nodal block, the atria are beating to their rhythm according to the SA node, and the ventricles are beating to their rhythm according to the Purkinje fibers. Total dissociation. Now, when you take your advanced EKG class, you will learn that there are different degrees within these. Like there's lots of subcategories. Do not worry about that. Just stick, tell me what first degree is, tell me what third degree is. And then fibrillation, well that's when you have contraction, but basically the heart is quivering. That's what it looks like. If you could see it, it's quivering. This is not chambers working in succinction. This is not effective blood pumping. In fact, the blood is probably not moving. This is dangerous. This is when we want to stop the heart and hope that the natural rhythm will take over. And we can do that in different ways, depending on the severity. Christine's in the back going, I'm sure on dramatic TV shows, get the paddles, clear, Ka-chink. Basically, we're electrocuting them, stopping the heart, and then everyone looks at the screen. And everyone's like, yes! There's, I'm gonna go again. Clear! Ka-chink! And that's, you're biting your nails like, come on, heart. And we're basically waiting for the SA node to go, oh, I was forgetting to do, that's right, pre-potential. Now I remember what I'm supposed to do. Good? Okay. When we get past our EKG exam, we will learn about problems with the cardiovascular system. It's kind of like an appetizer plate. I'll have chicken wings, I'll have taquitos, I'll have chips and dip. It's a smorgasbord. And it's just, it's just a sampling of some pretty cool cardiovascular problems. But we could spend an entire semester on the pathophysiology of the cardiovascular system. It's kind of cool. So I'll just pick a few. But we'll talk about ectopic pacemakers and Barbara Streisand. She's in the news lately. Do you know why she's in the news lately? Yeah, because who cares? Who cares? She got wrapped up in the whole Michael Jackson leaving Neverland documentary. She made an opinion, and now people are trolling her for making her opinion about Michael Jackson. But Barbara Streisand, for those of you who don't know who she is, she, she actually started out in theater. And she was the understudy for My Fair Lady. She didn't make the lead part. And the lead actress got sick. And Barbara Streisand got her chance. And up until that point, she was begging the director, just give me a chance, give me a chance, put me out there, put me in the game, coach. Give me a chance. 
And finally, when the main character got sick, she got her chance. And the audience was so taken with her that the director of the play put her as the lead role from then on out. And so cardiologists, they think of the SA node as that initial actress that had the lead role. Somewhere around in your heart, you have the Barbara Streisand cells. Give me a chance. Put me in, coach. Give me a chance. And they're just waiting for their chance to be the lead. And that's when we get our ectopic pacemaker. Somewhere else in the heart, not the SA note, is going, I'm going to reach threshold first. And whatever cell reaches threshold, boom, there goes your action potential, and it spreads. So it's weird. Ectopic pacemakers, some old school cardiologists might say, well, there's the Barbara Streisand. So now you know what they're referring to. They say that. Who knew you had Barbara Streisand cells? Ectopic pacemaker cells. So Tyler, here are your electrolyte imbalances. Matching section. Matching. About another mm, three to four questions. Come on, I think I'm at almost half of the exam, clear as day. Like, here is what to expect. And then a few questions will come from the first two pages of your homework packet, where I'm asking you about um, end systolic volume, end diastolic volume. Why does blood flow? Why do valves open and close? So let's go through our electrolyte imbalances. Let's do the hypers first. Again, this will be a matching. The bullet points will be your answer choices. You match them to descriptions, the same descriptions I have on the slide. Hypernatremia. Emia means in the blood. Hyper, too much. Too much sodium in the blood. Well, sodium is supposed to be found in the extracellular fluid anyway, but now it's too much. When that happens, <coughs> Sodium can actually bully its way through the calcium channels during that plateau phase. <clears throat> and if you have sodium bullying calcium out of the way, then you're not going to get as much calcium into the cell. And calcium removes the inhibition of tropin and tropomyosin. So what kind of contraction are you going to get if you can't remove the inhibition? Weak, if at all. So you're going to have a negative inotropy, a weak, flaccid heart. Hypercalcemia. What would we see? Well, in that one, we're going to see changes in both chronotropy and inotropy. With hypercalcemia, let's start with that, we'd get even more removal of inhibition. We'd get an even bigger force of contraction, a better stroke volume. And what would the brain say to the heart? You're good at this. You're so good. Why don't you take a break? And so heart rate goes down. That's why we see the negative chronotropy and positive inotropy. Hyperkalemia. I don't want you to know anything about inotropy or chronotropy because, quite frankly, it's all over the place. Just on an EKG, we would see tented T waves. Very sharp T waves instead of more dome shaped. What about the hypos? Hyponatremia. Well, then we're not going to get positive charges accumulating as readily, so it's going to take us longer to depolarize. So chronotropy will be impaired. Reduced heart rate. Hypocalcemia, not enough calcium coming in. We're going to have a weak, flabby heart. Not as good of a stroke volume. And what is the brain going to say to the heart then? You lazy son of a bitch. If you can't get a good stroke volume, then you're going to have to double time it. Reduce currency, then you need more of it. Reduce stroke volume, then I need more beats to make up for the difference. So positive chronotropy, negative inotropy. 
Hypokalemia, reduced potassium, will lead to U waves that we can see on the EKG. And U waves, when students read U waves, well, what does a U look like? Usually students go, this. So students predict on the EKG that the pen would go down and make the shape of a U like an inverted T wave, and that's not what it looks like. A U wave is still the pen going up. And students go, well then why the heck do they call it a U wave when it's not even shaped like a U? Well, because U is the letter after T. <laughs> that's the reason why they call it that. <clears throat> so, at this point, I would like you to take about 20 minutes or so to calculate your segments and intervals that are found in your lab manual. I'm going to set up my station so that students can come and look at their Lecture 2 exam that haven't already seen it. And then when we're done with that, I will finish the cardiac cycle lecture. You will need your homework packet for that, please.